Okay, let's uh, let's let's go ahead and get started. So uh, first of all, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. This is the PCI Deep Dive webinar uh, brought to you by SNCC. Uh, we're going to talk about software security framework to replace PADSS PCI. So uh, first of all, uh, let's jump over to the next slide and we'll talk about the agenda and then we're going to talk to our wonderful speakers that we have here today. So we're going to talk about, first of all, what's changed uh, and, and see what the requirements are in PCI. Um, and uh, the wonderful Jim Manico is going to be uh, going to be presenting that uh, to us. Uh, Jim's got about 15 minutes or so. We're going to we're going to take some questions as we go, maybe and make some and take some questions at the end. Uh, we also have uh, some of the pro tips and staying compliant. And Alexi here, Alexi Pivkin, is going to be talking to us uh, about uh, about how SNCC can help us with that with us on that journey. Um, about 10 minutes to, to to show you that, and then for a further 10 minutes, we're going to talk about a, a real case study which we have. Uh, we have um, we have Adam Thompson from uh, Deliveroo. He's going to talk to us. Uh, about the Deliveroo story. And then we'll have uh, some time at the end for Q&A. Now, uh, for Q&A, you're more than welcome to ask your questions directly through the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and I'll uh, pose those questions directly to our speakers. So please do ask those questions uh, throughout the webinar and I'll find a good time to, uh, to, to answer them. The webinar that we are uh, doing right now is recorded and we will send all attendees, whether you're here or not, uh, the, uh, the recording to this webinar um, and we'll, we'll send you that with some links uh, very soon after this webinar. The webinar will take, should take just under an hour um, and let's introduce our guests. So if we jump over to the next slide, we'll see, so we'll see all the speakers here. Let's start with me, why not? I'm talking right now, so let's, let's carry on. Um, my name's Simon Maple. I work at uh, SNCC. I run the developer relations team. Been here for uh, just over 18 months. Uh, my past, I was a developer for, my goodness, almost 20 years now, uh, mostly Java. I'm a Java champion, um, and uh, yeah, I do, I do love my Java. And yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be the host and the moderator for this, uh, for this webinar. Uh, so joining and kicking off to start off with, in fact, is gonna be uh, Jim Manico and Jim, uh, in fact, I've known Jim for a little while now, uh, both in the in, in the Java space as well as the uh, as well as the security space. Uh, Jim is the the founder of uh, of Manicode, uh, Manicode, Manicode Security. Which uh, for those of you who uh, who know Jim, I don't need to say that Jim's an amazing trainer. And uh, if you are looking for your companies to have any kind of security training, I would definitely recommend uh, Jim Manicode. Jim is also a Java champion and also a Java One rockstar. And Jim, for the last uh, the last couple of weeks, has been has been making me very envious with posting amazing pictures on Twitter of his uh, some of his some of his travels. Jim, do you have any elephants or any any rhinos there with you today? I have no rhinos with me today, but and, and by the way, in Nepal, it's not called a rhino; it's called a gaida. It's, uh, let's let's That's use really the right cool. term for this creature. So we did have what what Westerners would call a rhinoceros literally walk up to our vehicle about 10 feet away it kind of freaked us out but the rhino was raised by park officials it was, and, and was was a very human friendly rhino but it was one of the peak experiences of my travels and it's hey it's great to see you simon and great to be on the great to be on the on the on the show here with with snick i'm a big fan of your company i'm a big fan of what you're doing i'm a big fan of the community of people that work for snick and i'm real happy to be here today that's very kind. It's our pleasure to have you. And I love that phrase, human friendly rhino. I love that. That's amazing. So, Jim, well, you're more than welcome. Uh, Alexi, nice to meet you, Alexi. I, I'm sure you I'm sure I recognize you from SNCC. Uh, how are you doing, Alexi? Very well, thank you, Simon. I'm uh, excited about this topic. Excellent. And you're a technical director at SNCC and, and, and for a long time now, 10 years or so, you've been uh, helping helping companies with their establish and adopt their application security programs as well as help them putting that into practice in their in their software development in pipelines and things like that right yeah that's correct so i've been working with uh, all different sizes of customers around the world for the last 10 years and uh, helping them build application security testing programs and uh yeah very, this is pci was always a big part of of that for a lot of them wonderful and um, Last but by no means least, Adam Thompson. Adam is uh, the InfoSec Officer at uh, Deliveroo. So if there's one person who knows how to give a good delivery on a webinar, it's going to be Adam today. Welcome, Adam. Whereabouts are you calling from today, Adam? Thanks. Uh, we're based in London, actually. All of our awesome. engineering efforts are based in here in Edinburgh. 
Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, so you're you're local to me from uh, from from our both our accents. So that's good. And Jim is in uh, uh, Jim is in DC right now, right? Yes, I'm in the I'm in the DC office of Manicode. We have offices in Hawaii <laughs> and office in DC. I'm in the DC office right now. Wonderful. Aloha. And Alexi, you're in uh, Ottawa, right? Yep, correct. I'm in Ottawa, awesome. Canada. So we're all very welcome. We're all from very different parts of the world, and I hope uh, everyone is uh, from different parts of the world in uh, attending as well. Let's jump straight in. So on the next slide, we should have Manico Secure Coding Education. Over to you, Jim. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm happy to be here today. Let's talk PCI. Let's talk. Uh, uh a few elements of PCI and try to make sense of some of the new standards. Next slide, please. Again, my name is Jim Manico. I'll be your presenter today. I'm primarily a secure coding educator and author, and I focus on application security. And of course, in any application security program, managing the problem of third party library insecurity is fundamental to getting application security right. That will be kind of the theme of what we're going to talk about today. Next slide, please. So the question is, what is the PCI Secure Software Framework? Why is it important? And let's highlight some of the elements about this new framework that relates to third-party library insecurity and similar topics. Next slide, please. So first of all, let's take a step back. What are PCI standards? PCI, of course, is the payment card industry series of security standards. It affects everyone who processes a credit card this includes mom and pop shops all the way up to, to major multinationals. A lot of us who are in security know about PCI DSS. That's the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. This appears in my world a lot because it's it, PCI DSS cites the OWASP Top 10 and Application Security Guide as something that's important to PCI DSS. And, but PCI has many other pieces for implementing, configuring, and developing payment software in a secure manner. And PCI, these standards evolve over time. A large portion of the family of PCI standards are being reworked. And we're gonna look at a couple key aspects of that in this presentation. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at PADSS. That's the Payment Application Data Security Standard. Now, this is important to me because it's one of the original standards that governed how to develop payment software in a secure fashion. And when I, when I made the original slide, I said stuff like PADSS was not good. And, and the, the, the kind marketing professionals had me soften my message. So PADSS is high level. I, don't, I think it's not good, but we need to be more respectful. It's high level. It's problematic. It's not, a, it's not good enough guidance. And that's okay. It, at the time, it was what we knew. It was, a, it was a, a good piece of work at the time, but it didn't stand the test of time. And it's getting replaced. And it's getting replaced with the, P, with the PCI Secure Software Framework. One of the pieces is a standard, and one of the pieces is a series of recommendations. We're going to take a look at that in this presentation. Next slide, please. So, all right. So, the PCI Secure Software Framework. This consists of two major documents, two major standards. The first one, and they overlap and they're similar, but they're distinct. The first one is the secure procedures. This is primarily an enforceable, mandatory PCI standard for how to test payment software for security. This is what's on your plate, credit card processors, and stuff that you must do. Now, document two, this is one I'm really fond of. It's the secure software lifecycle, a secure SDLC, secure SLC for requirements and assessment procedures. Again, we have overlap here, but the second document is a series of recommendations for those who are building software, who are software developers, who are the makers and the creators, and what they need to do to, to build payment software in a secure fashion. Again, the testing standard is mandatory and required. It is in your face and on your plate. Number two is just a series of recommendations. I wanna highly recommend you look at this. A lot of folks who've tried to write guidance on, S on secure SDLC, this is a complicated topic. I'm not a fan of how a lot of people write about it, but this document is exceptional. They put a lot of good brain power into it, and we're going to look at it for those who are creating their own software in the world of payments. 
Next slide, please. All right. So let's take a look at the enforceable standard. Again, this is the secure software frameworks, secure software requirements and assessment procedures. This is gonna govern how you test software for security. And like I said before, it is mandatory. It's enforceable, it's in your face. And, and they, but what's good about this is, is that they, they had significant considerations around how to manage the security of third party components. This is somewhat, this is a topic that no one even talked about a couple of years ago that is now, in my opinion, the number one issue in the world of application security. I think managing third party component security is more challenging and even more important than injection class vulnerabilities like SQL injection. So in my top 10, what we're going to talk about is by far number one. And here's the link to this enforceable standard. I highly recommend you do your manual labor and read that manual, read that document. It's an excellent piece of work. It, it, and you know, when PCI DSS first came out, a lot of people insulted it and gave, gave it a hard time and critiqued how bad it was. And I, I now look at 2019 with this document. And to me, it was a really well-written document. Both of these secure software framework documents are really well thought out. I think it's just something we all should be reading. Next slide, please. So there's a, here's a nice quote that I'm pulling from the, the mandatory framework, the mandatory standard portion of the secure software framework from PCI. Coverage of all payment software components and dependencies, including supported execution platforms or environments, third party open source libraries, services, and other required functionalities. This is excellent that a, that a, that a standard is progressing system of software. In the world of banking, in my opinion, they put a lot of effort into writing secure software, but the problem is the third-party ecosystem, the third-party libraries we use, third-party services we use, third-party vendor software we use, and this testing standard really drills down into the fact that the way we build software just depends on lots of, of third-party componentry and services, and they're directly addressing it in a very clear way. I'm really happy about that. Next slide, please. So we're looking at, again, the secure software framework. This is the enforceable portion, the secure software requirements and assessment procedures. Say that 10 times really quickly. So 10.2, now there's a lot of different pieces. We're gonna drill down to 10.2. This is about vulnerabilities in the software and third-party components must be tested for and fixed prior to release. Yes, if you're not fixing bugs, if you're not, if you're not, uh, fixing or, or replacing insecure libraries, if you're not working with your team to stop creating bugs, you're not doing application security. You can quote me on that. So, and this standard directly addresses it. Now the requirements say, I'm just gonna read this, the assessor shall examine vendor evidence to confirm, assurance evidence to confirm that the software vendor has implemented robust testing procedures throughout the life cycle to validate the mitigations used to secure the software against attacks outlined in the vendor threat model and vulnerability assessment. This is about third-party components. It's really asking for a lot here to take that whole ecosystem seriously. And I'm impressed that they did this. Next slide, please. So the guidance, so again, 10.2 again is about addressing vulnerabilities in your software and third-party components that they're tested and fixed prior to release. It seems like such a simple idea, but we're in a, a state of the industry where a lot of companies don't want to fix their bugs, especially in legacy software, because of how expensive it is and because of how difficult and the knowledge and it's, it's very challenging to fix bugs in, in legacy software. But the standard's clearly saying if you're going to do payment software, you got to do this. And this is something that as a processor, you have to test the software to make sure these, these problems are addressed. Now, the guidance is pretty straightforward. We want to standardize on the use of known components. Now, that's a hard one, but think of it this way. The farther away you go from commonly used components, the less likelihood you're getting security. And even in known components, common ones, we still have a mammoth amount of vulnerabilities. I was talking to a friend of mine, Ron Paris, he's a JavaScript expert. We have React as the leading client side uh, user interface framework in the world today. And there's almost no bugs reported against all the third party components, yet we know how deeply insecure it is. And this is a, this is a really big problem. We've got, so even, even when you do standardize on known components, problems will still arise. This is why you need to conduct a form of security testing on your entire third-party component ecosystem. 
It's not an easy challenge. This is difficult. We need good tooling and other support, which, which, hey, by the way, SNCC happens to offer some stuff in that area, but this is critical to application security. And here's a quote from this section. Ideally, they should be subject to the same secure development and testing procedures as the software created by the vendor. Boom, that's huge. This is a really big ask of PCI, of the secure software framework that whatever third party components you're using, you should do just as much detailed testing as you do for any other part of your software. That's really laying down the law that we need to take this seriously. Next slide, please. So my favorite part of the secure software framework is the secure software lifecycle requirements and assessment procedures. Say that 10 times real fast after a few shots. So this is about how to build software. It's just a recommendation, but I think it's really well written and really well thought out. We should all read it. Next slide, please. Now, one of the portions, and here's a, here's a quote from the intro. It provides a baseline of requirements with corresponding assessment procedures and guidance to help payment software vendors design, develop, and maintain secure payment software through the whole software lifecycle. This is such a beautiful quote, it brings tears to my eyes and like that they're really clearly outlining how, how deeply we have to care about software security and payment software especially. Next slide, please. So if we look at control objective 3.2, we're now deep in the secure SDLC portion of the PCI secure software framework. So threats to software and weaknesses with its design are continuously identified and assessed. So I, I like this a lot. And the guidance is to determine how effective secure and defend software against attacks requires a thorough understanding of specific threats and vulnerabilities applicable to the vendor software. So there's, it's right away, they're really clearly saying that we got to identify threats, do some threat modeling. We want a mature process to identify, assess, and monitor software threats and design weaknesses, which usually automation is what rules the, rules the world these days. They're really thinking through it. And the point is, they're asking for detailed testing of what? They're asking for assessment, security assessment of your entire code base, including how to use third party open source or shared components or libraries. Boom. So there it is again, the, the talk about this obscure thing, these little third party components we use, it's directly addressed to something we have got to continuously test and assess for security. I love it. Next slide, please. So again, look at the test requirement in 32.3.2.b in a little more detail. They're asking for an inventory of open source components, a mature process to mitigate the use of open source components with known vulnerabilities, that the vendor monitors open source components throughout their user inclusion, and there's an appropriate patching strategy for the open source component is defined. You know, Equifax got taken down because of an insecure third party component. And when the patch was released for struts that ended up taking down Equifax, the attacks began three days later. So in my mind, an appropriate patching strategy is move fast, move when, when under 24 hours and take fixing bugs, bugs and patching third party libraries seriously, not checkbox compliance seriously, but let's update our software fast seriously. Next slide, please. So 32C says, again, um, for a sample of vendor payment software, the assessor shall examine assessment results. Again, they're calling out the entire code base, how to use third party open source components as an integral part of this, of this recommendation and requirement guide from the secure software framework. Next slide, please. So in 4.1 control objective, it says that existing or emerging software vulnerabilities are detected in a timely manner. So when we're using scanning tools and similar to look for vulnerabilities, we want to update the rule system of those tools on a regular basis. And again, they're saying when you're looking for emerging threats, whatever tool you're using, keep it up to date and make sure you're looking for uh, uh, vulnerabilities and detecting vulnerabilities in third party open source components yet again. So what this says to me is, is that when you are using tooling to identify uh, vulnerabilities in third party software, we want to keep those tools up to date, the rule systems up to date on a regular basis. Next slide, please. And the, the testing requirements of the same, the, the same um, section, again, security testing accounts for the entire code base. 
detecting vulnerabilities in any third party open source or shared components and libraries. It is scattered throughout this entire recommendation guide, not as a second class citizen, but as a primary thing you need to do as part of your assessment. I love it. Next slide, please. And I think that's your last that's slide. It for, that's Actually, it for me. No, no. Sorry, please go ahead. No, after you, sir. No, I was going to say, I was going to say, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that you talked about here with the software development lifecycle, I guess you've got different types of applications, some that are actually constantly going through pipelines right now. You're going to have other legacy applications that are going to exist, maybe not actively going through a pipeline because they're more in a kind of maintenance mode. And yeah. some things that are just going to be deployed in your in, in production that kind of sit there. And I guess developers don't want to touch it too much because, geez, they might break something, right? Um, I, exactly. I guess you know, this, this, this applies to all when of those. When I was doing a lot of my coding... Simon, I'm with you 100%. You know, I did a lot of my coding a couple of years ago where the philosophy was, once you get the application working, don't try to fix it. Don't update it. Don't mess with it. It works. And that kind of mentality is destructive in 2019. And there's no excuse here, Simon. You and I know this, whether it's legacy, whether it's a modern DevOps designed app, whether it's Lambda, I don't care. It was cloud type development. It doesn't matter. We have got to check for third party library insecurity in a continuous fashion. And I think in newer apps with newer pipelines and newer code repositories, this is becoming an easier thing to address. It's painful in the world of legacy, but you, you, you got to make a choice. You either want to do application security or not. You either want to either want to actually fix bugs, update software, patch your third party components and take the hit of the kind of work you need to do to fix your app when you do these updates and if you don't that's fine but you're not doing application security you're not serving your customers interests and the chance of the chance of harm happening rises dramatically when you don't take these issues seriously are you I, with me on that simon oh 100 100 and for a lot i mean you must see a lot of customers that come to you and say jim i need some training i need to understand how i can be pci compliant what what are the what are the key things that you feel uh, are some of the biggest issues that people have the gap you know i guess between what they're currently doing and what they need to do to become pci compliant is it is it tooling is it mindset is it process what's the biggest gap these days i, th I think it's a, a a series of things i don't know what the single biggest gap is but the, the thing that gets me is culture when i start talking to i go into some companies and i talk to a couple new programmers and they're like i've already gone through security orientation we talk about security every sprint and they're sending me to training as early as possible before I write code. I'm like, oh, great. Culture is a part of development at this company. Then I go to other companies who may have spent a lot of money on a lot of tools. And I talk to the developers and they're like, nobody tells us anything about security. They just want us to get our job done. So first, I think first is culture. Do you really like incentivize and encourage, if not force developers to do security engineering? And second, it's the tooling. Like you were saying, we're in an automated world. We're moving to DevOps, which is essentially in my world, let's automate all the things, automate building, automate deployment, automate security. Let's automate it all is a big part of what DevOps is. And again, if, if, if you're not running a third party library security tool on like a hundred times a day, I don't think you're doing it right. And it, mm -hmm. it, I, with new kinds of apps, this is pretty easy, Simon, but in the world of legacy, it's hard, but, you got to bleed. You got to sweat. You got to bleed. You got to, got to, you got to get it done. And I, I know that the work that you're doing here helps provide some of those answers. And I'm eager to hear. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jim, and a wonderful presentation. And we're going to move across now uh, to Alexi, and Alexi is going to talk to us about how uh, SNCC's approach uh, can help us with, uh, achieve some of the PCI goals, which Jim uh, just mentioned. So, Alexi, over to you. Thank you, Simon, and uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, this was this was a really great overview of uh, the changes that are coming in the pipeline from PCI. And from my experience working with customers around the world or, uh, for PCI, in most cases, you know, PCI ends up being more of a justification to bring in uh, tools or processes that will really help make a difference, right? And when you look at the new uh, secure software standard, it says if vulnerabilities in open source components, third party components have to be tested for and addressed prior to release, right? The old sort of status quo of, oh, oh we'll just do a security check before 
uh, we pushed this out into production in 2019 with DevOps and really fast development cycles. It doesn't really um, scale very well anymore. And what ends up happening is you have to have developers be an integral part of both finding and, of course, fixing any vulnerabilities that are discovered. So the unique thing that Sneak brings to the table here is that we've been Sneak has been built from the ground up as a developer first, developer focused security tool. And we have, so we actually are striving and we've built a tool platform where we actually want the developers to use, want the developers to be successful. And so far we have 300,000 plus developers actually use Sneak around open source security and be basically being able to use a open source components and stay secure while doing it. One big part of us doing that is being able to integrate into their existing tool, uh, tool stack and be able to do testing very early on. But then the other part that's really key and it's also called out in the secure software standard is the fact that it's not just about finding these issues, it's about fixing them as well. And at Sneak, we are able to bring some really cool automated remediation capabilities to the table where our users are able to fix issues about three times faster than an industry average. So it's very, very impactful. And uh, Adam will talk about that in a moment. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say here is that even though we're developer first, we have a ton of security depth and a ton of expertise. We believe we have the most comprehensive vulnerability database in the industry. And because coverage is really, really important in this area. So we really bring a full package to the table. We're able to help sort of address these PCI requirements, but we're also able to help developers not just find, but fix issues very early on and be able to essentially minimize the cost of, uh, you know, dealing with security issues. Next slide, please. And then, uh, so this slide just shows our various integration points throughout the DevOps. And of course, on the left, you'll see that we integrate into uh, typical development processes and tools, including the code, the Git repository itself, and of course, the CI CD. Uh, but the other thing we, we can also do, which is actually called out in the secure software lifecycle standard, is ability to monitor these applications and the open source components within those applications once they are deployed into production. Uh, specifically, looking for any zero day vulnerabilities that are discovered is being able to alert you to the fact that, hey, I've just, I have this application that's been running when I pushed it out, it had no issues, but guess what? Now there's a new critical vulnerability that has been discovered. And then we're able to, first of all, notify you automatically about that. And then the second is in many cases, we can also help you position a fix and actually address that issue as well. Uh, and the last thing I really wanted to say here, secure software lifecycle standard also calls out uh, having an inventory of open source components and actually knowing which open source components are used across your application. That's also a very key concern that I've seen amongst various customers, especially at, uh, within the teams that are worried about zero days, right? Worried about, hey, there's a new open SSL vulnerability, right? Apache stress vulnerability. Which projects are affected by that, right? So Sneak is also able to help there and help build that bill of materials and inventory. Uh, so so we, yes, we can help address the requirements of the new secure, secure software framework, but more importantly, we're able to plug in into your existing processes and work with developers directly to basically help them find and address these issues ever or no, before the security team has to dive into it. Uh, so that's all I wanted to cover here. Uh, if you would like, to, the only thing I'll mention is if you'd like to see a full demo, we'll share a link so you can schedule one. Uh, with that, back over to you, Simon. Thank you, Alexi. And uh, <clears throat> that was, uh, in fact, if we go back one slide, I, uh, I really, I really enjoy the uh, to see the integrations here at various parts of the pipeline. 
Alexi, the, the value in, in each part of this, I guess, is going to be quite different. But in terms of the you know, shifting left and trying to trying to run these tests and fix as early as we can in the pipeline versus, you know, doing things much, much closer to production. What's the differences in the value of doing things in these, you know, these different times of the pipeline? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm sure everybody on uh, who's uh, listening in has heard about shift left doing things as early as possible. Um, what, what I like to say is that we've actually started on the left and we've been expanding to the right. The idea is, of course, you're able to catch things as early as possible in the coding phase, or sometimes even before the code is written. Uh, be, and then being able to provide integrations into the existing automation and around Git repositories and pull requests and be able to find issues and let developers know about these issues as early as possible, you know, as soon as they submit a pull request or a merge request. And then, of course, you know, as part of CITD, where we're able to not only find issues, but also you're able to implement security gates to prevent things from being pushed into production if there are vulnerabilities uh, in an automated fashion. Mm -hmm. And in terms, of, uh, in terms of when we want to, I guess, stop these flows, um, do we want to stop on, you know, if, if a vulnerability exists at all, or are we just looking at kind of regressions through these flows? What's the, what's the typical path that we would expect? So this is uh, completely customer specific and very customizable. Uh, a lot of our customers start with the uh, stop the bleeding approach where you, you can sort of find all the existing issues and then where the next step is preventing anything new from getting into the code and going out. Um, but you, so you, could, you can absolutely do that as well as being able to um, address all the existing issues as well if the application is important enough. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Alexi. Um, I'll just say to everyone listening as well, please do uh, ask questions as we go as well. Um, feel free to go to the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, and there's a uh, there's a questions Q&A style uh, tab there. Open that and you can ping your questions directly across and I'll pass them across to both uh, Jim, Alexi and Adam. So if we jump to the next slide, I'll pass over uh, to Adam, who is uh, the Information Security Officer at Deliveroo. And Adam's going to talk a little bit about how, uh, how they've adopted PCI and using SNCC uh, to achieve that kind of uh, improved security. So Adam, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Simon. First of all, I just wanted to thank Jim for the insights on the, the new PCI software security framework. It's, it's really cool to see that kind of stuff progressing. And of course, Alexi for the pieces on SNCC. So I've been at Deliveroo for just over nine months now. And for those of you who don't know Deliveroo, we're on our journey to become the definitive food company, typically known for our food delivery service. We're currently operating in 500 towns and cities across 13 markets. We're a multi-sided business with consumers, riders, and restaurants. And we have over 2,500 employees with engineering efforts in London and Edinburgh. So when it comes to security at Deliveroo, we're actively hiring across three teams, product security, security operations, and information security assurance, along with a whole other number of roles open. So PCI at Deliveroo, can we go to the next slide? So Deliveroo is classified as a merchant level one under PCI standards. And I wanted to take some time to talk about how tools like SNCC have made our lives easier as security professionals. So when it comes to PCI DSS specifically, we're leveraging SNCC to meet requirement 6.2. So 6.2 is a requirement to ensure that all system components and software are protected from known vulnerabilities by installing applicable vendor supplied security patches and installing the critical ones within one month of release. So for those of you who aren't familiar for this requirement, maybe your SAQA uh, requirement based, and this actually came into play for SAQA. So watch out for it on your, your next certification. It came out in um, June 2018 in PCI DSS 3.2.1. Um, so if you think about the requirements that come into to play here and the scope, it can be pretty big, right? If you take a second to think about everything in your cardholder data environment, and the fact that you have to manage vulnerable vulnerabilities across all of it. Think about all the infrastructure application stacks you have, the self-hosted off-the-shelf products that you need to patch, and of course, open source dependencies. And I can only hope that you've got a, a cloud provider with a shared responsibility model to help you reduce some of that scope down, because otherwise you've got to care about everything in your data center as well. So, 
look out for future updates with the PCI DSS standard as well. There's definitely some expected ones coming in the future. Um, the PCI software security framework is just one update. There's going to be a lot more and they're going to start focusing on things like open source dependencies a lot more. Th there's normally a grace period as well. So if there's significant changes, don't worry too much. You're going to have around a year to put some controls in place where there's major changes to operations or technologies for, for businesses. So when considering requirements 6.2, the important factor is your vulnerability management framework, which define how you're going to treat your vulnerabilities ident identified by SNCC. Obviously, vulnerabilities de uh, defined as critical need to be resolved in a month period, as mentioned within the standard, but also consider that you can take steps outside of uh, patching potentially in the in the short term to as part of your vulnerability management framework to make use of things like a WAF or an IPS to prevent things from happening as a compensating control. Uh, can we switch sides? So before I go into the detail of how we're using SNCC, I just want uh, SNCC, I just wanted to give a shout out to Baden Delamore, who's uh, leading up the product security team here at Deliveroo, and he's been leading up all the integrations with uh, with SNCC. So SNCC specifically enables us to target vulnerable dependencies in code and dependencies in uh, Docker containers. So we hook up SNCC to scan our InScope repos, um, which include languages such as Ruby, JS, Swift, and Kotlin. So yeah, don't forget those mobile dependencies that may also have vulnerabilities baked into them. Uh, also, at the same time, we link up uh, with Amazon Elastic Container Registry to cover our Docker containers. And I'd like to call out specifically SNCC's ease of use when it comes to integration. You can go from no visibility to full visibility really quickly with no interruptions to workflow as you, if you desire that approach. And then you can turn on preventing no future, uh, uh, triaging new ones that come in. Um, so you have at least that, 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 that level of control, which is great. Um, and take a second to think about how you might check for vulnerabilities, SNCC picks up manually using a variety of different tools based on the languages you use. It's not fun. Having it all in one place is great and pushing it into the hands of the developer is even better. So when it comes to choosing a product like SNCC, it's an important factor to consider mostly is language coverage which means you get to visibility across the board. For example, Swift and Kotlin were the most critical for us to get coverage across our mobile apps as well. This isn't always offered in the other tools out there. So we're, we're just starting our journey with SNCC and we have a range of work to do to make use of all the helpful automation and insights they provide to other engineers while shifting it all the way to the left so that when they develop code, they can start thinking about these things. I think that's it for me, Simon. That's awesome insights. Thank you very much, Adam. Just a, <clears throat> a quick question about, I mean, I, I was really interested when you when you talk about the visibility, right? Because I think a lot of the time with applications, we kind of ignore what's actually happening under the covers. And I'm sure Jim sees this as well when when he when he you know talks to talks to a bunch of groups and he says, you know, you know, what, what have you got under the covers of your application? Have you got how many directs, how many indirects and things like that? So from the visibility point of view, Adam, did you see did you see that it was good to see the visibility in just the dependencies you use? Or is it, you know, the, the vulnerabilities that exist in them as well, or the licenses? What was most what was most interesting to you in the visibility stage? Yeah, it's pretty much seeing it all down all down uh, the stack. Really, having the the visibility within dependencies itself to see what they use is an amazing insight, right? You you never would consider, hey, what does this random library actually use within it? You have to consider the the fact that open source libraries often use others, which may also be vulnerable. Obviously, the licenses piece is a great thing. Like legal, legal are going to love that part, and it's going to be a great help to them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, and in terms of your uh, your development team, I guess, um, how complex was it before using a tool like SNCC um, to when we think about the remediation? If you were to if you were to have a vulnerability, I guess without without something like SNCC. Um, how hard would it be to actually try and dig into where that vulnerability is and what the what the fix would be for that vulnerability? Because I guess a vulnerability could exist three levels down in a transient dependency. What, what kind of difference has uh, SNCC made in terms of you know when you go to fix those kind of vulnerabilities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean obviously SNCC provides their, the vulnerability database, which provides all those insights for an engineer on hand as soon as a, a vulnerability is raised to them, they have it. They don't need to go looking for things. They don't need to uh, look for fixes. They have them there. It's stated what the fix is. SNCC can also help you patch as well. 
and bump uh, dependencies up. So it's all there, ready to go. There, there's really not much for a developer to do. Mm -hmm. And the patch, that's a really interesting thing. Alexi, would you mind giving us a little bit of information about the differences between an upgrade and a patch and why they would use one over the other? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we've actually realized that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you run into a situation where there is a very popular library that uh, has a vulnerability but does not necessarily have a fix, maybe it's deprecated. Uh, so we've actually uh, have gone out and created a number of security patches for these libraries where there is a, a, a vulnerability in a very commonly used package that does not have an immediate fix. So Lodash was one of the more recent examples uh, where we've actually, and then we're able to uh, apply that patch right over the, the vulnerable library as a basically a temporary fix until a full fix is available. And we see a lot of, so right now we do this for Node and JavaScript, but we see a lot of uptake with so over 500,000 downloads of our patches a month. Hmm. Interesting, and, and Adam also mentioned the uh, the SNCC vulnerability database, which is uh, which is an interesting one. How does how does that differ from existing vulnerability databases or more public databases? So uh, we, we sure, yeah. So we have a lot of uh, so we, we do we don't just go out to the uh, you know known sources of data like NBD. Uh, we actually do a lot more than that. So we hand curate any data that's coming back from there. So we, we do obviously look at that data. Uh, we hand curate it, make sure it's accurate. We confirm things like version ranges, but we also do a lot of our own research and sleuthing around. We have an intelligence platform that looks for unsurfaced vulnerabilities. We partner with academic institutions. So uh, there is a lot of data that comes back uh, that ha that's in our database that's uh, coming from basically per these proprietary sources. And uh, we're also, I guess it's worth mentioning that we are also actually a CV numbering authority. We have uh, released, I think we disclosed a thousand vulnerabilities last year. And uh, yeah, so a, a big chunk of our data actually comes from these sort of proprietary sources. Awesome. And uh, a quick question uh, coming from uh, Abhishek. Uh, he's asking about, um, does SNCC also list out transient dependencies? So for example, uh, if, uh, if a, a, a library uh, has, a, has a direct dependency on, a, on another library and we're trying to pull in uh, that first library, would SNCC, uh, would SNCC detect and test both of those uh, different level libraries? Uh, yeah, I can take that one. So yeah, so absolutely. Uh, so at Sneak, one of the things we do is we actually compute and calculate full dependency trees, including both direct and indirect dependencies, and then we analyze those trees and we actually help you visualize them as well. So yes, absolutely. Awesome. A um, couple of questions, actually, one for Jim and one for, one for Adam. I'll start with, uh, I'll, I'll start with Jim. Um, when we think about how people want to adopt PCI requirements, some people are going to be in a, in a more DevOps style pipeline already, and they're adopting that kind of, uh, you know, quick flow to production. Others are going to be more of a, you know, uh, maybe delivering very, very infrequently, maybe only on major releases, delivering every month, two months, six months. Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of the state of how easy it is to adopt something like PCI, will people, you know, are, are you able to, uh, to do it easily without adopting a kind of DevOps flow? Or is, is it just, you know, something that you need to just bite the bullet and go more into a DevOps pipeline stuff? And that was a question for Jim, if you're still there, Jim. If not, maybe Adam or Alexi can take that. Yeah, Adam, do you wanna, are you okay taking that? Yeah, if you can just repeat it quickly. I was just curious, so what the, the, the question was, um, if for people who are already in a, in a, a DevOps style pipeline delivering over to production regularly, um, are you in a are you in a far better place to adopt the the or, or, or you know be part uh, be, be compliant with the PCI regulations uh, versus someone who's not pushing to production as often more in a legacy kind of pipeline? Yeah, I mean definitely. If you think about some release cycles for large monolithic applications, they only get done once every quarter, 
once every six months. That's not enough to even meet the basic PCI standards. And to go back with, to what Jim was saying earlier about uh, treating vulnerabilities seriously and getting them fixed sooner than typically is required by compliance requirements, it's really important that we do that. You don't want to become the next major breach. Um, so really, it's, it, is, it is easier if you're deploying more regularly and you have a CI CD pipeline. Uh, of course, it's possible to meet those requirements still. Um, but there's much, much better ease of use if you have a, a good deployment pipeline. Okay. And, and one final question for you, Adam, as well. Um, talk, thinking about the way uh, developers, I guess, who are, who are going to be pushing through that pipeline constantly, how developers uh, have adopted security and how they're taking responsibility for security. What do you feel uh, are the key, the key things that, that is needed for a developer to, to really adopt security? Is it a tooling thing? Is it a mindset thing? And, and what, what has worked so far in the delivery organization? Yeah, it, it's really a, a combination of them all, really. You have to have the right level of engagement to cre create the right security culture, whether that's a decision to go down a champions framework or having specific people in different areas of the business that are sort of required to do this and feeding that into maybe even like performance reviews and things like that to make it in, in, in line with what they should be doing as part of their job. There's loads of different ways you can um, sort of get the level of engagement. But one of the really important things is having tooling like SNCC that really enables people. If you put in a gate, it's going to be really hard to convince people that it's a great thing because it's, it's just going to slow them down. So if you give them the, the information to make informed decisions, more often than not, they're going to do the work because they do actually care about delivering secure code. You just need to enable them in the right way. Awesome. Thank you very much, Paul, to Jim, to Adam, and also to Alexi for, for, uh, for some great content and uh, wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank you, Simon.